Greetings, ladies and gentlemen! Welcome back to my channel! In the previous video, we barely touched such an extraordinary thing as time is. Saying more accurately, we touched the time dilation phenomenon exceptionally. However, is the time dilation phenomenon shows that the time by itself passes differently in different conditions, or it does merely indicate that only our clock ticks with the different rate in direct dependence on those different conditions themselves. You'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Let's start, or rather continue, our analysis. The theory of relativity unambiguously says that it's not a clock ticks differently, but the time itself passes with a different rate. It is a crucial thing for the theory of relativity. However, that's precisely the case where the constancy of the light speed plays its crucial, but still quite tricky role here. Since the theory of relativity insists that the speed of light is a constant and we can measure the distances good enough, the time is the only variable we left to manipulate. However, as we've determined it on the basis of Albert Michelson's experiment, measurements of the velocity of light in a partial vacuum, the speed of light is not a constant, but a variable value, what indeed depends on the conditions of its medium, on the conditions of the spacetime, on the total strength of gravity, other words. Therefore, let's find out how exactly the passage of time is being measured nowadays in order to understand where the problem of the constancy of the light speed begins. Let's start from the very beginning with the question of how can we measure the passage of time? What tools should we use for it and how can we be so sure that our measurements of the passage of time are correct? Those might sound like silly questions, but there is much more into it when digging even a little bit deeper. Let's start with a good old mechanical clock, the pendulum clock. The same clocks we've been using for centuries to keep time. Now we perfectly know that the time period of the pendulum depends on the only two variables, the length of the pendulum and the acceleration of freefall. There is an equation describing the time period of the pendulum. Utilizing this equation, we can calculate the pendulum time period. For instance, when we have a 1 meter length pendulum, considering the acceleration of freefall on Earth as 9.8 meters per second per second, the period of such pendulum is about 2 seconds not take into account the atmospheric drag, of course. As a result, we can put such clock in any place on Earth and they are going to show the exact time as precise, as precise we can measure both the length of the pendulum and the acceleration of freefall. However, as you can see from the equation, the acceleration of freefall plays a critical role for such clocks. Therefore, if or even when we would place the exactly this clock in another place with the different gravity conditions, let's say on Mars, where the acceleration of freefall is only 3.7 meters per second per second, the period of such pendulum becomes longer, about 3.25 seconds, what approximately is 1.6 times slower compared to the pendulum's time period in Earth's gravity conditions. As we can see, under the different gravity conditions, saying more accurately, in conditions with the different rate of the freefall acceleration, absolutely the same clock ticks differently. As a result, keeping this precise case in mind, I want to ask one more time again. Is it the time as such passes differently in different gravity conditions? Or it is our clock ticks with a different rate, directly depending on the conditions they are in? Luckily for us, it is quite simple to check, because there are lots of ways to measure the passage of time. We can use a different type of clocks, the different mechanism, which works using the other principles 
to eliminate the variable that relies on the free-fall acceleration. As a result, to check the indications of a pendulum clock, we can use a balance wheel clock. Let's have a look at the equation that describes the working principle of such a balance wheel clock. As you might notice, such clocks are not acceptable for the influence of the acceleration of freefall, because in the equation itself there isn't any dependence of the freefall acceleration at all. As a result, we can use a balance wheel clock to check the indications of the pendulum clock. As long as we are stationary relative to the pendulum clock and the surface of the planet we are at, as a final result, when we would compare the ticking rate of the pendulum clock to the ticking rate of the balance wheel clock in those different gravity conditions, we could clearly see that it is not the time as such passes differently, but the pendulum clock itself ticks with a different rate. Using this simple example, you can clearly see that some clocks may have a different ticking rate because of their direct dependence on the conditions they are in. It's not a wonder by itself, since any pendulum clock's principle of work is based on the acceleration of freefall. Therefore, if there are different conditions, particularly different freefall accelerations, a clock that depends on such conditions will tick with a different rate. However, at the same time, it doesn't necessarily mean that the time by itself passes differently. Nevertheless, the balance wheel clocks are far from perfect in relation of measuring the passage of time, because they also have their weaknesses, the same dependence on the conditions they are in. Despite the fact these conditions are a bit different than the conditions for the pendulum clock. And I don't want to mention all the factors here, like the thermal expansions of the material the balance wheel itself is made out of, and the gravity influence, which led to the turbulence invention in the end. I simply want to stay focused on the relativistic effects exceptionally, because the balance wheel clock is also accepted to the influence of such effects. As we can see from the equation describing the balance wheel clock's work, there is a moment of inertia. What in its turn is described as the mass times the radius squared. Therefore, as soon as the balance wheel clock starts moving, its indications will be distorted because of the influence of the first relativistic correction. As we all perfectly know, the faster matter goes, the heavier it becomes. As a result, when such clocks start moving with any speed, the balance wheel itself is going to become heavier, what in its turn changes its moment of inertia, and in the final result, the faster such clock could move, the slower they would tick. What brings us to the same important question considering this particular case? Is it the time passes differently, or it is a clock ticks with a different rate, directly depending on the conditions they are in? Precisely like in the case of the pendulum clocks and the different accelerations of freefall. Are there any other types of clocks that could be used to check the balance wheel clock's indications? As we did it using the balance wheel clock to check the indications of the pendulum clock. Let's see. There is also a non-mechanical type of clocks, the atomic clock. The most precise and widely used clock we have nowadays to determine the exact passage of time. This clock doesn't have any mechanical parts and uses the different state of atoms to determine the time. Besides, since all the atoms are absolutely the same in their essences, the precision of such clocks lies on an entirely different level, not even compared to the accuracy of the mechanical clocks. However, despite the most obvious advantage of such clocks, I mean much higher precision compared to the mechanical clocks. 
This type of clocks also has its disadvantages. This type of clocks is very sensitive to the influence of both relativistic corrections. Let's start with the second relativistic correction that depends on the strength of gravity, what is much more complicated than the simple change of the acceleration of freefall for mechanical pendulum clocks. For instance, on the one hand, in today's modern physics, one second is defined as 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. However, on the other hand, we also have such an extraordinary thing as the time dilation phenomenon, specifically the second relativistic correction. As a result, we have a bit awkward situation, saying as politely as it possible. If we place such a precise atomic clock near the massive mountain, it ticks slower. At the same time, if absolutely the same clock is placed either on the top of the same mountain or on some height, it ticks faster. The same atomic clock, placed in different locations on Earth, ticks differently. It happens precisely because of the time dilation phenomenon, since in different places on Earth the strength of gravity is a bit different. I know, the difference is tiny, but I do love the accuracy, especially in physics. As the final result, there is a question. In what region of the Earth the precise atomic clock should be installed to define the right time to begin with? At least, we have to define the specific gravity conditions, where such clock will indicate the right time first, right? However, since it hasn't been done yet, there is no right way to define the right time yet, even using the most precise atomic clocks. Moreover, there is even more intriguing thing. Even if we would determine the right placement for the Etalon atomic clocks on Earth, and define the specific gravity conditions for them to indicate the right time, the clock's indications will differ throughout a year anyway, since the Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. The Earth-Sun distance continuously varies in certain limits. As a result, when the Earth is at the closest distance to the Sun, the total strength of gravity at Earth is a bit higher. At the same time, when the Earth is at the farthest distance to the Sun, the total strength of gravity at Earth's location is a bit lower. Also, there are other planets in our solar system, which also influence the ticking rate of the atomic clocks on Earth, because the distance to them varies as well, and, as a result, the gravitational influence on Earth also differs. As a final result, the indications of such super-precise atomic clocks will also be distorted. Nevertheless, it is necessary to admit that such an influence of the time dilation phenomenon I described above, particularly the effect of the second relativistic correction, which depends on the strength of gravity, is practically nearly unnoticeable, mainly because all the atomic clocks in the Earth's gravitational sphere of influence will do absolutely the same thing simultaneously, and there wouldn't be any possibility to determine it, at least at the moment. But as soon as we could distribute atomic clocks on the whole solar system, things would become much more interesting. However, on a great scale, we still do not have the right tool to measure the exact passage of time nowadays, even using such a precise tool as the atomic clock is. Simply because even the most precise atomic clock, the most accurate instrument we have at the moment, cannot provide the right or the exact time yet, 
merely because the indications of such clocks also depend on the total strength of gravity. What in its turn brings us to another, even more awkward situation. How can we be so sure that the speed of light is constant when we are not able to measure the precise time yet? Does it necessary to remind you that the speed by itself is nothing else than the distance divided by time? Therefore, even if we know the distance very well, the measurement error of time, occurred because of many reasons I described above, leaves some uncertainty regarding the light speed itself. Therefore, it is not the right thing to say that the light speed is constant, since we still do not have a precise way to measure time, because the overall accuracy of such clocks is affected even more than the accuracy of mechanical clocks when they are placed in different gravity conditions. Moreover, using the atomic clock to determine the passage of time, and then using this determined time to measure the speed of light is a bit little too recklessly, don't you think? If you are using one electromagnetic wave, which depends on the total strength of gravity, to determine the speed of another electromagnetic wave, that also depends on the strength of gravity, the result is more than obvious. The speed of light will always appear constant in this case, precisely because, as the speed of electromagnetic waves depends on the total strength of gravity, then any change of it will result in the change of indications of the atomic clock. That's precisely why the only experiment that showed the different light speeds is Albert Michelson's experiment. If Albert Michelson had been using the atomic clock in the measurement of the velocity of light in a partial vacuum experiment, he wouldn't have been able to find any difference in the light speed propagation at all. But luckily for us, he didn't have such precise clocks and had been working with the mechanical types of clocks, which not acceptable to the influence of the relativistic corrections, since there was no change either in the motion or the acceleration of freefall. What by itself casts an extremely dense shadow on the constancy of the light speed once again. However, I don't think someone would ever notice such a shadow, since many people have been living in twilights all their lives and didn't even notice such a bright solid proof I've been talking in the previous video. Nevertheless, as you can see by yourself, there are lots of problems to measure the exact passage of time, even using the most precise atomic clocks and we were talking exceptionally of the second relativistic correction here. Do you want more? Let's dig deeper then and consider the first relativistic correction. Let's start with the light clock. The principle of work of such clocks is quite simple. We have a light beam that bounces between two parallel mirrors. When we know the precise distance between mirrors and the value of the light speed, we can use such clocks to determine the passage of time as well. Depending on the distance between mirrors, there can be millions of the light beam bounces per single second. We simply have to count those bounces, and as a result, we have probably the greatest timekeeping device ever, isn't it? Is the light clock the best way of keeping time so far? Yes and no. When the light clock starts moving, they also begin to tick slower, the first relativistic correction in action. This representation shows why the moving clock ticks slower. Actually, it is how the first relativistic corrections has been discovered in the first place. 
However, despite the fact that the similar representation had been used to discover the first relativistic correction as such, the theory of relativity fails to explain what happens when we switch nothing but our point of view only, which has to be equal and good to do physics in either way, according to the theory of relativity. It stops working as soon as we choose any other reference frame except the only valid one, the stationary reference frame on the ground. Let's consider it in every detail on the basis of well-established global positioning system. So, we know that on the satellite has its influence both of relativistic corrections. Let's consider the article Real World Relativity the GPS navigation system. The link to the article is in the description table somewhere down there. The quote. Because an observer on the ground sees the satellites in motion relative to them, special theory predicts that we should see their clocks ticking more slowly. Special relativity predicts that the onboard atomic clocks on the satellites should fall behind clocks on the ground by about 7 microseconds per day because of the slower ticking rate due to the time dilation effect of their relative motion. Further, the satellites are in orbits high above the Earth, where the curvature of the spacetime due to the Earth's mass is less than it is at the Earth's surface. A prediction of the general relativity is that clocks closer to a massive object will seem to tick more slowly than those located farther away. As such, when viewed from the surface of the Earth, the clocks on the satellites appear to be ticking faster than identical clocks on the ground. A calculation using general relativity predicts that the clocks in each GPS satellite should get ahead of the ground-based clocks by 45 microseconds per day. The combination of these two relativistic effects mean that the clocks on board each satellite should tick faster than identical clocks on the ground by about 38 microseconds per day. This sounds small, but the high precision required of the GPS system requires nanosecond accuracy, and 38 microseconds is 38,000 nanoseconds. The end of the quote. Right, we have calculated everything written above using the surface of the Earth as the base reference frame. And everything does work perfectly, I have to say. But these calculations only work when we are do them from the Earth's frames of reference perspective. Let's move our reference frame to the satellite and see what happens. In this case, we don't even have to calculate the second relativistic correction. As we are in lower gravity conditions, our clock would go faster on the same precise 45 microseconds per day. Take into account that our reference frame is on the satellite now, we can say that identical clocks on Earth tick slower on the same 45 microseconds per day. Not a big deal, right? We have the same 45 microseconds difference, either using the Earth reference frame as a basis or the satellite one. However, the first relativistic correction acts in a bit weird way in this case. According to the theory of relativity, we can count our current satellite's reference frame as a stationary one, but the Earth's reference frame as a moving one. It is the essential postulate of the theory of relativity, and it is a crucial thing here. As the Earth moves relative to us, the clock on Earth has to tick slower on the same 7 microseconds per day. Combining these two relativistic effects means that the clock on Earth has to go slower than the clock on our satellite 
on 52 microseconds per day, right? The clock on Earth should tick slower on 45 microseconds per day because of the second relativistic correction. Plus, the same clocks on Earth should tick slower on 7 microseconds per day because of the first relativistic correction. Combining these two relativistic effects means that the clock on Earth has to go slower than the clock on our satellite on 52 microseconds per day. But wait! Counting the Earth as the starting point of calculations, a kind of the base frame of reference, in order to get the right synchronized time from a satellite, we have to make the clock on satellite go slower on 38 microseconds. And it's working perfectly, I have to admit. But when we take the satellite as the base reference frame, making the satellite as a starting point of calculation, we have to slow down our clock on 52 microseconds to allow observers and nurse to get the synchronized time. However, these results are out of order. What indeed proves that if we switch the reference frames, the theory of relativity stops working. But you can easily say, I do not understand the theory of relativity. I will not argue. But let's make this example a bit more extreme to understand what I am talking about. And, as the second relativistic correction values were the same, we can exclude it from our example. So, we have a planet and a satellite, which goes on its orbit around the planet. Also, we have two clocks, one on the ground and the other on the satellite. The satellite's clock and the clock on the ground were perfectly synchronized and indicated the exactly the same time before the launch. For easier calculations, let's make this satellite go at the speed that is about 7 eighths of the speed of light. You'll see why in a moment. And now, let's make calculations based on the special theory of relativity to calculate the first relativistic correction using the planet as a starting point of calculation first and then the satellite. Being on the planet, we can say the satellite moves relative to us at the 7 8 speed of light. As the special relativity predicts, the onboard clock on the satellite should fall behind identical clocks on the ground. We can calculate this falling rate using this equation. As we can see, when satellite having the speed of 7 eighths of the speed of light, because of the relativistic effects, onboard satellite's clock sticks two times slower than the reference clock on the ground. Therefore, in order to get from the satellite the synchronous time, we have to make satellite's clock go two times faster. In this case, the moving on board satellite's clock and the stationary clocks on the ground will show the exact the same time, right? We do the same type of calculation to calculate the first relativistic correction for a GPS satellite's clock. But now, let's move to the satellite and calculate the same, but from the satellite's perspective. So, being on the satellite, we can say the planet moves relative to us at the same 7a speed of light velocity, respectively. As the special relativity predicts, the clock on the ground should fall behind our onboard clock in this case. We can use the same equation to calculate the falling rate of the ground clocks. As we can see, because of the same relativistic effects, the ground clock should tick two times slower than the onboard clock on the satellite. As a result, 
in order to send from the satellite the synchronous time, and the observer on the planet should have gotten it right, we have to make our satellite's clock go two times slower. In this case, the moving clock on the ground and the stationary onboard clock on the satellite will show the exact the same time. Let's compare the results. When we take the planet as the starting point of calculation, as we did it in the first case, we have to speed up on board satellite's clock two times to get the synchronous time on Earth. However, when we take the satellite as the starting point of calculation, as we did it in the second case, shows that we have to slow down on board satellite's clock two times, in the same order, to get the synchronous time. As you might have noticed, we have two radically different situations here, one of which completely contradicts another. From the one reference frame's point of view, we have to do one thing – speed up the clock. But from the other reference frame's point of view, we have to do the other thing – slow down the clock. What do we have to do with the onboard satellite's clock? Which calculation should we use to make things work? As the practice based on the GPS shows, we have to speed up the onboard satellite's clock to bring the system to work. In its turn, this means nothing but the only thing. That one reference frame doesn't equal to the other reference frame. Isn't it nonsense? It directly violates the first postulate of the theory of relativity, which says that all the reference frames are equal and good to do physics. Isn't it a solid mathematical proof that the theory of relativity, if not completely wrong, but at least not entirely correct, using a proper form to speak. But who cares, right? And I didn't mention yet either the Lorentz contractions or well-known paradoxes the theory of relativity gave us from the very beginning. I'll spare those for another video. Right, as you can see by yourself, the theory of relativity works, but works only, I would even say exceptionally, when as a starting point of calculation is taken the only one particular frame of reference, the surface of the planet we are at. It is the only reference frame we must consider as at rest for all calculations, period, or the full stop if you wish. But this is not the end of time yet. I mean the story of time. If you still want more, then here you are. There is one worth thing to mention left. There is also a completely different method of measuring time. It is radioactive decay. For example, the radioactive carbon-14 decays by a process called beta decay. During this process, an atom of radioactive carbon-14 decays into an atom of nitrogen-14. One of the neutrons in the carbon-14 atom decays to a proton by emitting an electron and an electron antineutrino. This increases the number of protons in the atom nucleus by one, creating a stable non-radioactive nitrogen-14 atom. In other words, the radioactive isotope of carbon-14 decays into the stable isotope of nitrogen-14. The half-life of such decay is 5700 plus minus 40 years. This precise process is used in radiocarbon dating. It uses the naturally occurring radioisotope of carbon-14 to estimate the age of carbon-bearing old materials up to about 58,000 to 62,000 years. 
However, even using this type of measuring time has its problems. Not long ago, it was accepted in physics that the rate of the radioactive decay is constant. Radioactive decay by itself was an arbitrary process that nothing could influence. However, it was considered this way until December of 2006. Namely, on December 13, there was a solar flare due to which the rate of the radioactive decay deviated from its norm. Moreover, the deviation was recorded four hours before the solar flare and continued over the next several days, in about four days, if I remember correctly. Subsequently, the theoretical physicist Abraham Fischbach and a group of researchers found out that the rate of radioactive decay varies slightly throughout the year. This variation mainly depends on the distance at which the Earth is located from the Sun. However, sometimes, as in the case of a solar flare, the rate of radioactive decay varies without any discernible reason. You can check their work by yourselves. The links are in the description table. One of them is Perturbation of Nuclear Decay Rates During the Solar Flare of 13 December 2006, as well as the article Evidence for Correlations Between Nuclear Decay Rates and the Earth-Sun Distance. I believe the variations in the rate of radioactive decay also depend on the total strength of gravity. Since the Earth-Sun distance continuously varies, the gravity influence at the Earth's distance varies as well. I think it is the root cause of the change in rate of radioactive decay. What brings us to an interesting fact in its turn. If the gravity conditions were different in the past, because of the third interacting body problem, for instance, it introduces even more uncertainties regarding the determination of the age of the organic structures using the radioactive decay. In this case, the real age can differ from a determined age quite significantly. So, ladies and gentlemen, I guess this is it for today. It turns out that our ability to measure the passage of time is still quite limited, even despite using the most precise instruments we have nowadays. Because the indications of absolutely any clock will be inevitably distorted by the conditions this clock are in. There are no perfect clocks which would show the exact time regardless of any changes of the condition they are in, either it is a mechanical or an atomic clocks. As a result, we can positively say that the ticking rate of all the clocks depends not only on the passage of time as such, but also depends on the conditions such clocks are in. And this statement is applicable to absolutely any clocks we are using to keep time. And the keeping time by itself is not that easy, as it might seem from the first look. I bet you have even more questions now than you had before. Nevertheless, you know, it's great when you have questions, because the more you study, the more you know, the more questions arise. This is the only way to go forward, to ask the questions. In my turn, I am delighted I have some answer to such intriguing questions, even if such answers disagree with the officially accepted theory. Even if you don't like my answers and may call them bad, I can say in return that even the bad answers are much better than a complete absence of those. And much, much better than any of postulates, which don't answer anything at all to begin with. Thanks for watching and have a good day. Bye-bye for now. See you in the next video, because I still have 
A lot to tell.